Well, we're here today for a combination of our passions. Our passion for architecture, our passion for the built environment, and our passion to get the remaining learning units for the year all in one day. So let's satisfy those passions. I do appreciate you choosing to spend this hour with us. This seminar is uh, good for a health, safety, and welfare learning unit. I'm not real big on talking about what I'm getting ready to talk about, but the Washington AIA folks love for me to do that, so here goes. Uh, Greg will uh, jump in and talk about how this project came about. It's a really unique story. It had some really unique challenges. We'll walk through an in-depth building envelope study talking about the weighing risk versus reward. Uh, we'll talk about the idea of shifting gears in a project late, late in the project, when that makes sense, uh, when it doesn't. And we will complete this material study with uh, a virtual tour of the precast production facility and uh, the job site. This project, the Block uh, Executive Hall, it's, it was an interesting journey. It started out with a very different vision than what it came, came through in fruition, how it was completed. Uh, it's really interesting because from a subcontractor's perspective, I can tell you, and I have a background in design, so I've seen this on both sides. I think even with all of the design-build collaborations that we've done, the design-assist collaborations, there's still, I think, a perception that the architect and the contractor have an adversarial role. And some would even call it a healthy tension. You have the architect that is concerned about the beauty of the building, the design of the building, the function of the building, and then you have the contractor that cares about what it costs and whether it's gonna stand up or not. This process really was much more of a collaboration. It was a lot more like this, and that model that I described was really turned on its head. You had BNIM as the design architect. They were very cognizant of the cost requirements on this project. They had a budget that they were striving for, and as you'll see as Greg gets into the material studies uh, through the energy modeling and so forth, they were very concerned about how this building was going to function, how it was going to perform. Uh, how it was going to work from an energy efficiency standpoint. And on the contractor side with Enterprise Precast, I could tell you we had a great deal of concerns about aesthetics. Being an architectural producer that uh, has done projects like the Kaufman Performing Arts Center and uh, the, the Seton Hall renovations out at K-State uh, that won an honor award uh, last night. So we really cared about how this project was going to look uh, the fact that it was going to hold up, that it was going to perform well. I can tell you it was something different in that terracotta tile was being cast into an insulated sandwich panel and that was the first time that this had been done in the United States. So this wasn't something that we were asking, are we going to get to do this project as much as do we want to do this project? A lot of research went into that and I'll talk about that on the back end of the hour, but this, this was one of our more uh, decorated uh, projects in terms of uh, design awards and, and that sort of thing. But it was really just, just a great uh, collaborative process. It was a team effort and uh, we were all in this together. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Greg, let him introduce the players. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Dirk. Can you? Make sure you got a sight line here, because I want to see it too. Um, just real quick, Dirk mentioned the idea of the collaboration, and it was a pretty large team. Uh, the general contractor was Jay Dunn. We were teamed with Moore Rubel Udell out of Santa Monica, California, and then you can see the rest of the uh, design team that was put together for that. An interesting project in that when we interviewed for it with the University of Missouri, we interviewed for a traditional design bid build process with Moore Rubel Udell, and were selected. Through a lot of curious political intrigue, the, <laughs> the delivery method changed 
to a design build situation and we transitioned from working from the, for the University of Missouri to working for J.E. Dunn. And so that did influence some of the decision making that we did on the project. So anyway, so that was a very, very interesting process. The general design overview, since we're architects, I had to put some of this in. I'll go through, I got a ton of just random slides. I'll go through some of them. Very early sketch, Buzz Udell, just the idea that we knew we were on the footprint of the building. We knew we were going to stack. We knew we were going to go vertically. We had to get circulation up through the building from day one. That was a key part of the concept. Another early sketch of trying to study what was that space going to be like? What was the potential for the atrium that would unify the classroom spaces across the three levels that we were going to have to deal with um, in the building. We went through an exhaustive kind of traditional stacking and blocking process. We did them hands-on with the university, with the user group. We'd all sit in a big room and move things around, and the users absolutely loved it. They thought it was a great way to design a building. Um, this is kind of the finished model of the building. Let's see if I can make the pointer work. Yes. Um, this is the site that we had here at UMKC. Oh, gosh, and I hit the wrong button. Um, this is the existing building that they had. This is the original Snow Hall where the business school started. This is the building that they added in the 1980s. You know you've been practicing too long when the building that I worked on is now considered so out of date, they got to do something about it. Uh, and then this is the more recently completed student union. And as you'll see in a minute, we were on a site in between those two locations. Here's the site plan for it. We were here, the existing building, excuse me, the existing building wraps around here. Uh, this is what they at the time were calling the School of Management. This is the original old house where the uh, program had started. The union sits over here. Parking would be up here. This was for the union. The school's parking was down here. Cherry Street's up here. And Oak is down here. Uh, basic floor plans for the project, the lower level, some classroom space down here. It's actually a lab research laboratory like sleep research and some curious things they were going to do. Mechanical room, lobby down there. This is the main thrust of the project and you'll see some images here in just a second. This spine going from the existing block school to the student union, this pathway through became sort of everything in the project. We were trying to celebrate that connection between buildings. The main auditoriums on that floor, one of the active learning classes rooms that can be subdivided in three units is located there and you'll see in a moment this kind of bleacher array with the big bulletin board in the middle to sort of amp uh, uh, you know magnify what was going on in that space second floor at that time under the Dean this was the key for the entire building um, this was their active learning classroom it was a laboratory for coming up prototyping and developing design ideas they would do charrettes here run over in the model room build prototypes it was how do you bring a product online and that was part of their business education that they were doing. This was kind of one of the key spaces in the whole building, another classroom, associated offices. And then the top floor with the atrium reaching all the way to the top, the uh, main offices, some faculty offices, and additional classroom space and an outdoor uh, roof terrace and then building core over in the corner. Um, renderings that were done to celebrate that. This is that spine running through the lower level of the building, the curving pathway, the big auditoriums behind that atriums going up through. We came up with these three kind of funny lizard head oculi skylights that sit on top of the building, second floor, third floor up there. This is that spine going through the building, the auditoriums on the left. Potentially that was a coffee shop. I don't think it ever happened here. This was the big video wall, the bleachers that looked at it. Henry Block, the person who donated the money for the project, he donated $36 million for it. We thought we spent all his money on the block building at the Nelson. We were wrong. Uh, and so, but that's him, his image there on the wall. And then here it is from the other side. And <clears throat> This is that kind of bleacher array and is intended for casual informal seating day to day, but students can then actually sit there and, and there could be like a panel discussion. They can show imagery on the wall, sort of make it to activate and, and activate that central space of the building and all of it looking up through the atrium to the big skylights at the top. A view on the second floor, just kind of looking out across through the atrium, the active learning classroom, the big main uh, classroom is over here on the right. And then up on the third, no, still on the second floor, this is inside that uh, main uh, classroom, totally flexible, everything moves. Uh, it's supposed to allow for an extremely flexible learning environment. Oops. And then this is kind of the final model, and you can see uh, here's the addition, existing building over here. We're just right on the corner of it with an outdoor connection, and then there's the student union on beyond. So, Dirk mentioned one of the big things for us at BNIM, we're kind of obsessive compulsive about the energy performance of a building. And so we came up with on this job, like we do on almost every job, a set of energy goals. 
And one of the things we often start with, you've all seen this, a lead scorecard. We generally just start with the idea whether the client cares or not. Can we build a building that's so efficient that in theory we could get all 19 energy points And if we were submitting for lead? On this one, the owner chose not to, but asked that we strive for a lead gold, the make the building look as though it could have gotten lead gold, even though they weren't going to formally go through the process. So our goal to get all 19 points was to see if we could get a 48% energy reduction overall. When we do that, one of the things we usually do at the beginning is say, what can we do to make the envelope of the building contribute an equal share in that model? So one of our goals is whenever we start with this idea, we'll take, say, the requirements, the U-value requirements for a mass wall or a steel-framed wall or the glazed framing system, and that's what the baseline model is going to be when you run a modeling analysis. It'll be based on the ASHRAE minimum standards. I think this was two, we used 2007 at the time. So if we're going to say the envelope's doing its fair share of the work, we want to reduce the heat flow. The U value is what? How many um, BTUs per hour flow through a square foot of wall for every degree of temperature difference? We want to cut it by down to 48% of, uh, cut it by 52%, or cut it by 48 so it's only 52% of what it should have been. So that meant our mass walls we wanted to get from 0.104 down to 0.054, steel frame, 0.064 to 0.033, the glazing systems 0.5 down to 0.26. So we set that as this lofty, noble goal that we always start out with. So that, from an energy perspective, is where we started. The other thing that you notice that Dirk was talking about, this terracotta idea, where did that come from? Well, we looked at this, and the campus there is very much a masonry campus. So you start at the old traditional, here's Oxford Hall, I said snow, it's Shields, my mistake, Edwin Shields residence from 1909, that's where the School of Business originally started. A traditional uh, beehive kiln fired kind of random colored ready brick. The new student union is a buff, modern, very contemporary sort of a brick at this end. So here is that existing uh, Oxford Hall right here. The addition that I remember working on is a fairly conventional red brick. And this building up here is the yellow. And we're talking about what we were calling the path of innovation. It was a theme of the deans that the, innova the path of innovation was never a straight line. He liked the idea that there were always mistakes and twists and turns anytime you got from an idea to a finished product. That's why this thing is kind of curvy. But we started to come up with the idea is we want to use masonry. It's a masonry campus. We want to do it in kind of a contemporary way. And how do we unify the red brick to the yellow brick? What does all that mean? Uh, Steve McDowell, principal in the office, design principal, he really liked, this is in London, England, this St. Uh, Bolifus, something or other, hall. It's a, it's a uh, ecclesiastical facility, and this is actually a dormitory for the, uh, the Jesuits. I think it's a Jesuit school that lived there. And this building's a wonderful old building sitting there with a many different colored arrays of stone, of uh, maybe stone or terracotta, I'm not sure which. It's got the red brick. It's got all those different colors on it. And the architect in England decided to try to play off that using the terracotta system by using multiple colors. It was sort of a, using this as the basis, not mimicking it, but trying to keep the same color palette. This was done by NBK. And we thought, well, that's kind of cool. Maybe that's what we should try to do, something like that. And what we came up with conceptually was at the no south end of the site next to um, the Oxford Hall, we would start with red. And then as we moved to the north, it would transition to where it was much more of a buff tone like its neighbor to the north, the Union, and then transition back. So abstractly, that was the masonry concept. It would transition from the south to the north. Here it is actually applied to the building elevation. That's the facade right here that faces north to the student union. That's the facade that faces south toward Oxford Hall. And you can see the idea was then to blend and transition. So the building sort of shifted as it moved from one side of the site to the other. Here are some elevations that start to show it actually in practice. That's the north, excuse me, the south elevation the masonry there that's trying to be mostly like Oxford Hall immediately to its south. This bar is rotated out of the building to celebrate the uh, fact that that's that primary learning space that for the program as it was envisioned at the time. That's the active learning center there. Um, I could tell a whole separate story on facade glazing in terms of shading coefficient and things like that, but we don't have time to do that today. We're going to talk U-value today, but this was the subject of a lot of intense study. 
couldn't afford what we wanted to do. Um, then this is swinging around and looking at the building from the southeast corner, looking right at that rotated bar. And you can see here how now, while it's red here, the transitioning is going on over here. That's a panel of core 10 steel kind of keeping the, the deep red tone. Uh, this is the actual true straight on uh, east elevation. Uh, this then is that north elevation, so you can see the color is trying to speak to its neighbor to the north, to the student union. And then this is us out there on site, Bob Simmons, the director of uh, MU, my good buddy Casey Cassius, who's now pretty much retired but was hands-on on this project. Uh, this is the color array that we came up with to try to make that transition. This is comparing it to the existing building. And everyone got out, looked at our samples, looked at the thing. Everyone thought, well, this is an interesting idea. Let's give it a try. The dean absolutely loved it. He was from China, loved the idea of terracotta. It was a traditional material from his country. And his idea of using something old in a new way he was he was all over it he thought it was great so this is where we started then using that reference that I showed earlier this is a classic uh, terracotta rain screen system we love rain screen systems we use them all the time it's one of it's a really really good way to build a building envelope this is what's shown here is NBK's standard system and that's where we started uh, as you can see, it's comprised, of, it assumes some sort of backup. In this case, I'll show more in just a second, a steel stud system. And then you can create for the rain screen, you get your uh, secondary water air vapor barrier membrane, insulation continuous over the outside, as continuous as you can get it. And then NBK has this incredibly clever support system that they've really developed that has these vertical rails, horizontal rails, these ingenious little clips that grab the edge of the terracotta. So you just put it up there, clip it in place. They've really thought it through. The downside of it, you'll see in a second, is that's a heck of a lot of aluminum. And it's like a giant cooling fin on the outside of the building, and there's a substantial penetration through the, en the uh, envelope, <coughs> excuse me, through the insulation plane of the building. In section, this is what it looks like as we originally envisioned it. We were going to have a traditional steel stud here. Uh, then we were going to have a sheathing on the outside. Probably in this case, we we're going to use plywood, the secondary water air vapor barrier, insulation plane of I think about four inches of mineral fiber insulation. That's our go-to insulation almost all the time on a project. And then here's that NBK system. There's the downside. All that metal connected to this metal, connected to this metal, connected to this metal. They make some thermal breaks, shims, and things you can use to make it better, but we were a little disappointed. Remember we had that goal, we were gonna reduce the energy flow uh, by 48%. Um, so we were trying to get, see what we could do. When we actually ran the U value on this basic assembly, the basic assembly, we got down to 0 .58, 0 0.058, that was only 9% lower, nowhere near the 48% that we were after. So that was a little disappointing and unfortunately, with that, we hadn't really done the thermal bridge analysis on it. Um, when we do that, if we had taken it seriously, we probably would have done a therm analysis on it. But from what we've learned on that, I bet when we were done, we would have been right at the ASHRAE baseline. We would have lost all our gains, and we would have been right there. So it was what it was. That's where we were at. And so that's where we started. And then we had a good friend on board. We were now working for J.E. Dunn. Something they cared about a lot was the budget and the schedule. That made a big deal to them. I don't understand quite why. Um, but the budget for the project, Henry gave him $36 million. I don't know where the rest of it went. But anyway, the building budget was $24,300,000. Building was 68,000 square feet. So we were running, trying to hit a target of $357 a square foot. Um, Dunn made a meticulous cost model of what they thought it would take to get there, making assumptions for all the different systems in the building, the glazing systems, the facade systems, you know, everything else. The other killer on this job was they had to be open to start school in August, and we were starting construction in March of the year before. So we had 18 months to have a finished building, and that was considered a very significant challenge for the project. So that's when, in brainstorming with Jay Dunn and talking to, with them, one of the ways they wanted to get this done was to bring on as many associated subcontractors for sort of a design assist up front as they could. They were really pushing us to think about using precast on it because of the speed that goes with precast as opposed to the system we wanted to do. They liked working with Enterprise and brought Enterprise on board. And thankfully, 
Enterprise, as Dirk said, was willing to work with us on the idea. They had never done this before, but they were willing to do it. NBK had, in Europe, done some casting of terracotta into precast panels and had done a ton of research on it. They had, I think, one non-insulated job in the U.S. on the East Coast. They shared all their information with a fairly skeptical enterprise who went through it with total due diligence and finally agreed, let's give it a try. So this is the panel that we came up with, and it had some really significant advantages uh, to it as, as it finally came together. The panel we came up with was going to be a four-inch interior wide of concrete, three inches of a cast-in uh, extruded polystyrene insulation, pretty typical. The outer wide was nominally overall four inches, including casting into it four-foot-wide strips of a 30-millimeter NBK terracotta panel. I think it was their, what, tear it solid system or whatever. And then, very importantly, uh, we used a similar system to this when we did Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts with Enterprise. At that time, Enterprise, for some reason, was kind of being a little more stubborn. We used a steel truss to tie the two Ys together, even though we wanted a non-metallic tie. Now Enterprise has now embraced the carbon cast system. So we were able to use the carbon cast ties to tie these two Ys together, non-metallic, really, really, really essentially eliminated the thermal bridging issues that we were looking at. And by putting this together, look where we were able to get. We got the UV, now the one thing is the other assembly we were using a steel wall as the basis, the comparison. This we were saying a mass wall, but compared to a baseline mass model, we were targeting reducing by 48%. We got the U value down to 0.057, that was a 45% reduction. We're now getting where we wanted to go. And that's really exciting. One thing is if we had really gone into lead on this, if we were actually applying, we were going to research the idea of mass wall. We've got enough net concrete thickness to qualify as a mass wall, but the way it's written in the co in ASHRAE, it's like eight inches with insulation on one side or the other. We ran it right down the middle. I, we wanted to understand what that meant. We never actually <laughs> got there. The other thing that this did, and I'll show you more on this in just a second, the idea was, here comes this panel, and it's got the terracotta cast into the outside. The inside, we just used the as-cast or as-floated finish and then sandblasted it and said, that's it. The interior finish of all the walls was sandblast. So what does that mean? In that other build-out, I meant to talk about that real quickly, one of the things done was really worried about schedule-wise was they would have to build a reinforced concrete frame then they have to come in and set these steel studs. Then they have to come in and put on the plywood sheathing. Then they have to come in and put on this membrane. Then they come in and have to attach the NBK fastener system. Then they have to set the insulation. Somewhere after this membrane is on and probably after this is set, you could say the building is tight and they could start doing interior finishing because their critical path was starting the interior finishes. That was the critical path. But then, even if they got started, they still had to come back, hang the tile, hang the jip board, tape, sand, finish, paint, you know, all that kind of stuff. They were, like, going crazy. Now what we've got is one panel that does everything in one pass. So what they liked about it, here it is in plan, they could be working on casting the reinforced concrete frame of the building. Simultaneously, Enterprise in the plant in Nebraska is casting these panels. As soon as the frame was ready, they would come and hang this panel. And we use the concept on these panels that the inside layer of the concrete was going to provide the air barrier. Precast is generally has very little shrinkage cracking or anything like that, and you can rely on it as an effective air barrier. It's thick enough, it controls permeance, as would this insulation, so it's also the vapor retarder. So what we did was said, that's the magic building envelope line, the outside face of the inside wide. Put that sealant joint in. Once they set this panel, set this panel, put that joint in, building's completely weather tight. That's it. The panels are done. The building's weather tight, and all they had to do was come back and wherever it was exposed, put in a, a, a cosmetic interior seal and to create this kind of rain screen cavity, put in this a seal on the outside and then the whole envelope's done. You're finished. That's it. Oh, one thing I forgot. See that insulation right there? 
We were doing this right at the time I think every code consultant in the country learned about NFPA 285 testing, and our co code consultant went berserk that we were exposing the edges of a, a foam plastic insulation product in the exterior envelope of the building. We went round and round and round. He wanted Enterprise to hold all this out and stuff it with uh, mineral wool. They were a little hesitant about that. We finally got him to agree, what if we stuff the joint with a mineral wool? It actually is really kind of nice because it continues the thermal envelope of the building beautifully. And it also protects the edges from flame spread. I, it turns out the way the, the, that rule's written, this panel's actually fine without it, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, in any event, but that's it. So they set the panel, put that joint in, the, the, envelope, the opaque envelope is completely finished in terms of weatherability. Cosmetic seal here, the inside's done. Put this insulation in and this seal and walk away. That's it, building envelope's done. And they loved that because think how fast they were gonna be able to get the building enclosed and how little time they'd have to put into it. I'll talk a little bit more about glazing in a second. This is the glazing system then detail. We played with the same idea. It's a simple frame. We put the structural portion of the curtain wall system in plane with the back plane of the, uh, of the uh, concrete panel. Uh, then all they had to do was set this. There's the primary seal again. They put that seal in place. Then they'd set the glass, put the pressure rate on, boom, building's weather tight, completely enclosed, they're done. They can do anything they want on the inside. That was it. The only thing to finish it, put that sealant joint in, put the infamous insulation in right there. Put on the snap cover, custom profile. YKK did this, and they were willing to do this custom-shaped snap cover, so it completely trims the opening when they put the snap cover on the pressure plate. Put a sealant joint out here, and it's done. So it's an amazingly fast installation, and so J.E. Dunn was very, very happy. And we went, uh, the other thing I didn't mention, that giant assembly that I was talking about just a second ago, when Dunn priced this, by the time everything was put together, we were creeping into the $90 a square foot facade cost to put that together. This assembly by itself right here, I think we ended up in the 50s, 50 installed. installed. So we basically cut it in half. So we really improved the schedule and we cut the cost in half and we got much better energy performance. So we were very happy. So that was actually really good. So that was the key to that whole thing was once we realized the budget and schedule issue, Dirk mentioned that kind of about face, we realized we had to explore options. We turned around and kind of midstream, at that point we were actually creeping up on construction and we're working with Dunn, uh, we made the decision to go to this kind of a system. Um, I want to do one quick tangent. It doesn't have to do with precast, but I think Dirk will forgive me. As part of that mission, because of the fascination with building envelope, we really got into what could we do with the curtain wall system. Could we really ever get where we wanted to go? Remember what I said earlier, we wanted to get to where oh, we had that 48% reduction. What we wanted to be able to say was that the facades of the building, the opaque areas and the glazed areas, could have a 48% reduction in energy heat flow compared to the baseline model. The method of evaluating that, gosh darn it, me and my buttons. Um, uh, I'm never going to get this right. Uh, the, what the baseline model would have would be an opaque area, mass wall baseline of this number, 40% for glass would be this number. So we had to say we had to do 48% better than that if we were going to hit our target. So our building then, so yeah, 48% reduction. So what that meant was we had to turn our 0.26 average into a point, uh, 0.136 average for the walls and the, glaze, the glazing systems in the walls. The problem we had to compound the whole thing was the ASHRAE baseline for a project is 40% maximum for glass for your model. We actually have 47% glass, and that's actually really low for one of our buildings, but we were at 47%. So the challenge for us became how on earth can we get the, um, we've got 7% more glass than the ASHRAE baseline, but we want to reduce it by 40, uh, 48%. What on earth can we do to try to get it down there? Uh, a typical glazing system, like a one-inch insulating glass and a standard curtain wall gets a U of 0.046. That's just under the, the, uh, the baseline model of 0.05. So how can we have 7% more glass and not only get from a 4% difference all the way down to 48%? Well, the thing we did was we really looked heavily into, and this is the reason I wanted to share it. It's amazing. There's some really good systems out there for glazing now if you can afford to use them. Uh, we, some really, truly thermal broken, high-performance aluminum glazing systems and the phenomenon of three-element glass. This is the system that we went with for the baseline. This happens to be YKKs. There's a couple company that, companies that make it. The structural extrusion, the key to it is that this extrusion out here that carries the, the tongue that mounts the pressure plate 
only goes through this. It does not actually bridge back to the structural portion. It's completely separated by these polyamide thermal breaks. The weight of the glass is carried by this little chair. The early versions of these systems, they had trouble with these things busting from the weight of the glass. You can now get several company systems where this is a non-metallic, is a composite system. They're even better. And then if they could want, did one that had three element glass, you can get U values now instead of that 0.5 that you were talking about as the baseline model, you can get down to 0 0.17, 0 0.36, numbers like that. So that's kind of what we did. I don't want to bore you with all these numbers, but so what we decided we would do, we could get down to where we're 39 to 63% less than a typical system, 44 to 60% less than what was going to be the baseline model. So if we did that, could we get where we wanted to go? Well, it was really kind of cool. We were trying, remember, to get our 48% less would get us down to 0.136 for the average U value for the heat transfer through the wall. 47% of the area was glass. The system we finally come, came up with, averaging it out, 0.094 for 47% of the wall, wall area, 53% of the wall area, the precast we just talked about with three inches of extruded polystyrene, 0.3. The average we could get was 0.124. Oh my God, we did it. We actually got it 53% less. And so it was like, oh my God, we're gonna do the best building we've ever done. Well, unfortunately, um, J.E. Dunn had built a cost model. I had begged and pleaded to get the darn thing out of the storefront realm and give us real dollars to do a real system, and they were carrying $77 per square foot. God bless them. Unfortunately, that system we were looking at was running just under 100. Um, I wanted to go through and say, okay, can we downsize the mechanical, you know, go through that whole process. There was no time. And the owner said, people will think we're extravagant if we put in three element glass in our building. The answer is no. Okay, so strategy number two, can we meet our goals or how close can we come if we go back to one inch insulating glass in a standard frame? Can we get down to that number? That's our target. The glass alone, before you add the precast in, busted the bank. Nope, can't even get close. That's how important glazing system is in getting energy performance out of a building. So strategy three, and we were still pretty happy with it, what we did, that was our original target. We used the, the high performance glass. Well, we used the high performance flaming, but one inch glass. We got it down to where 40% of it, 47% of it was at U.036. And then we had 53% of it, the precast panels. And we got it down to where we had the average for the glazed and opaque walls was 0.199. So we got a 24% reduction. We got halfway where we wanted to go with the building that sits there now. Uh, that would have been equivalent to seven energy points. We'd originally tried to get 19. When you actually ran the model of this, because remember the envelope doesn't tell the whole story, in fact it doesn't even come close, we actually got 12 points on it and by the time, because we had some really, um, just, we had underfloor air systems, we did all the tricks we could think of mechanically that the university would accept, and we actually got, uh, we got about 12 points for energy and it, the building was good enough it could have gotten lead gold, so we were pretty excited about all that. Uh, this part then, I'll go through fairly quickly, just because we're architects. The documentation was fun on this. You know, obviously we drew all kinds of cool wall sections and things like that. One thing that was nice is we used that underfloor air system. So we had this distance from the top of the concrete slab to the actual finished floor. It made mounting the precast really easy. We could just use big, ugly connections and put it all together just the way the enterprise wanted to do it, you know? And uh, just, just put them together and just cover them up and it was all great. So it, that was, it worked out really, really well. It was easy to put together. Uh, Steve McDowell, our principal in charge, became obsessed with having curved corners on the building, just obsessed with it. Here we actually did use NBK's system. Oops, I actually got their catalog out. This is one of my crude little sketches. This is their clip system mounted to the outer wide of the Enterprise system, and Enterprise custom curved all of those tiles, and then every one of those was hand set up the corner of the building. Thank goodness the building was weather tight at that point because this was the slow part. Uh, we foam put uh, a spray foam insulation in the joint to keep the continuity of the envelope through there. Uh, then, yeah, we did, we actually drew carefully every one of the pieces that we wanted. And, uh, uh, NBK, when they make these things, they actually do a fresh mold every time they make them. I didn't know that. So anyway, that was the basis. We had little baguettes and things we used over the window systems. We actually then worked with Enterprise. We laid out every single panel, had a legend for which color tile went where. And the poor guys at Enterprise got to take that, go out there, and you're gonna see some images from Dirk in just a second, lay every one of these things out in the bed, cast the panel, and 
I can't do it. If John Collier was here, he was our field guy. The only reason I have this in here, they made one mistake on the whole job, and John caught it. It was amazing. One of these two panels was made like, I can't remember now what it was, but they basically made the same panel twice, and there was only one thing in it different or something. And so, but John looked up and saw it and said, oh my gosh, that's wrong. Well, we didn't make him cut it out. So uh, in any event, so that, I think that may be my high speed run through, yes, that was my high speed run through our fascination with the building envelope and what our goals were and then the ways we uh, were trying to approach it, the about turn that we made to try to make it work. And in the end, I think we got to a, I think a really successful project. So you can wrap it up. I so. <laughs> well, I'm gonna run us home here. One of the things we liked about this project, we being Enterprise Precast, is we really felt like a full partner on this project. Like our opinions and expertise were valued in a design assist fashion. We see two different kinds of uh, projects, one where we're treated more as a full partner and one where we're more as a commodity. We're here to make whoever look good and if something goes wrong, it's our problem, figure it out. Uh, this was an effort where we were really working together as a team to, si to solve a, a budget problem, to solve a schedule problem, to solve an energy efficient problem. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, this was something that was very new to Enterprise Precast. Uh, the idea of doing terracotta in an insulated sandwich panel. So a lot of research went into this on our part. We got into things like coefficient of friction, elasticity, uh, knowing that our panels were going to bow a certain amount with intolerance. Could those strips of terracotta you know, handle that without breakage? Uh, so we got into that. Freeze-thaw testing, pull-out testing, and to the credit of NBK, the terracotta producers, when the German manufacturer standards didn't match up with the American testing standards, they went, ventured out on their own to do a little bit more testing just to give everybody else a comfort level with the project. So at that point, we did, everything seemed to be lining up from a cost standpoint, from a logistics standpoint, uh, we jumped on board. And you know, Greg already mentioned the C-Grid system. One of the things that was key to the, to the success is the insulation was tied together with a carbon fiber system that it was coated with an epoxy resin system. So this ran every two feet on the project. It's thin, it's uh, stronger than steel in tensile strength. And a key thing was it gave us 100% composite action, which uh, is, is what allowed the terracotta to, to work uh, from a manufacturing, a Boeing standpoint, and so forth. Uh, this was a, a four-story building. Uh, the first level was, uh, the site was sloped, so there is a smaller, uh, lower level. My favorite thing about terracotta is you can spell it three different ways and still be correct. <laughs> really helpful for a guy like me. But a terracotta tile, it is uh, similar to brick. Uh, there's, uh, we do a lot of thin brick jobs. It is a, uh, a clay product. It's a fired product. You can get different colors. Uh, the product that we used had a uh, grooved uh, system. And you know, Greg talked a little bit about you know, rain, seal or rain screen versus rain barrier. Typically with a masonry project, you have all these joints all throughout the project with a precast system, you just have a joint every 10, or in this case, every 12 feet, and the precast itself is, has only a 6% absorption rate, so the precast itself is your moisture barrier. The tile that we were using was grooved on the back, so when the concrete was poured on top, it adhered to those different points. Uh, there was a shiplap joint, and it was actually sealed at, at that point, so what you saw here was not grout or, or concrete in the joints, you saw a shadow. So it was an optical illusion. It looked just like it would look if it was a terracotta rain screen system per the original design intent. So this is our plant manager, Gary. He's one of our uh, several 20-year tenured guys that we have experts in our plant. He's our plant manager. 
he is what I call a servant style leader. He leads and he manages, but he's also you know, not, not afraid to jump in and get some work done and lead by example. This is him actually setting the first few tiles from the first panel. And as Greg mentioned, this five color random blend was, there was nothing random about it from our standpoint. BNIM told us this color here, this color here, this color here, this color here. So we took no chances. We uh, uh, had color-coded instructions, although I challenge anybody to go out and find the matching panel out there. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> John could tell us where it is. So then that tile is placed, this is a 12-foot wide tile. Each of these is four feet long by six inches tall. Here you can see a block out for a window. I'll let you in on a little trade secret. How did we keep that concrete from going to the surface? Have you ever heard the phrase, you can do anything with duct tape? <laughs> That's how we did it. Here you can see that first layer of reinforcing uh, getting put into place. This was a mild reinforcing project. That's a galvanized wire mesh. Uh, here you can see the lifting loops on the perimeter that are used to handle the panel with the crane. And then that first wyth of concrete was poured. And then you see here it being smoothed and vibrated into place. Uh, that's a very critical step. It keeps the mixture fluid, make sure it's all, everything is settling in the right place, uh, reduces bug holing, and uh, th those sorts of things. Then you can see them placing the insulation with the C-grid. So that's bonding every couple of feet uh, with the uh, precast on both sides. It's put down while it's still wet. This is all poured in one day. We turn these beds every day. So then once the insulation is in place, that second layer of reinforcing is put into place. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's attached to the insulation. And then we actually put mesh chairs uh, in here to protect the, the surface of the carbon fiber before we put the mesh on top. And then casting electrical is put in on what is the inside face uh, so you can have nice flush uh, power outlets on your walls. Then that second wife of concrete is poured. Here you can see a little gravity connection at the bottom of the panel. And then the second day we go in and uh, there is a cylinder as part of our PCI requirements to maintain those standards. We cast two cylinders with the same mix under identical circumstances. It's put in this compression chamber and uh, it's actually broken. This gauge uh, measures a strength. That's how we confirm that our product has made strength. So it's going to within 12 hours cure enough so that it can be re uh, extracted from the production bed. It's technically still curing for another 28 days. So we'll do another test in 28 days and that, at that point it will have settled somewhere between 5 and, and 7,000 PSI, pounds per square inch of strength. That's how we confirm that our product has made strength. So the second day uh, it's prepared for stripping or extracting from the production bed. So you can see here that a side rail is taken off. And uh, then it's actually lifted. There is an internal rail system in our production facility. Picks up that panel. Then it is uh, taken out where it's cleaned uh, and stored in the yard. And here you can see a whole bunch of panels out there being stored in the yard. And that, and that is our, our virtual plant tour. Let's do a virtual job site tour. Yes. What PSI was your concrete that you used? Yeah, 5,000? Between, between five and 7,000, yeah. The PCI requirements require you to be above five. And, and the terracotta, was it laid on? Uh, uh, what material was it laid on to ensure that the finished well, surface was uniform? Yeah, we, yeah. we use all wood beds. Yeah, instead of steel. So it was a wood bed. We had spacers in there, yeah, that we used and, and then uh, poured the concrete on top. So this was a four-story cast-in-place building. 
Greg already walked through the design. Here you can see that atrium space. Uh, here you can see those panels starting to go into place. You might remember that uh, gravity connection that you saw on the bottom of that panel in the production facility. Uh, Greg mentioned we uh, knew we had the luxury of having a raised floor in this case. In some cases, there's actually a recess in the cast-in-place slab so that that uh, can actually settle down. You can have a flush floor. In this case, we didn't have to worry about that. And there you can see it starting to take shape from the outside. And that's obviously before the curved piece went into place. And here you can start to see, when I first saw this going into place, I thought, you know, the concept was maybe that these darker sides represented a shadow, but I quickly realized with this more contemporary structure representing a dividing point between, on the campus between where there is a concentration of red brick buildings and more cream-colored limestone buildings on a traditionally masonry campus. They wanted to acknowledge that and did that with a larger concentration of cream colors on these two elevations, this and the one behind it, more reds on this elevation and the one directly behind it. How many days did it take you to settle the camera? Uh, we did roughly, I want to say it was maybe eight panels a day on this one. And we've done more before, but this, this was a different process. Uh, J.E. Dunn Construction, it was actually their self-performed group that did the installation. They were obviously a uh, full partner on this as well. Here you can see that shadow effect. And then crossing the finish line, some com completed project photography. Is it also a it, it's a pre, it, it, we left off the exterior, the insulation, the exterior wide, and then put a fairly conventional insulation, and mm -hmm. then kind of just a rain screeny terracotta panel over. The, I mean, excuse me, uh, Cortan panel over the top. So I, I want to say we had about three weeks of installation overall. Remember how many panels full? I don't. <laughs> off the top. <laughs> we uh, probably did four or five a day. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here you can see some finished photos. There's the Steve McDowell curved <laughs> tile on the edge. Those were field installed. Uh, you can see the detail here. The number Minus of times I got pulled aside by G to <laughs> talk him out of it. It's like, it ain't going to happen, guys. <laughs> for, for the curved corner instead of just Maybe a quirk I, I remember them not being inexpensive, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say, premium. you know, you mentioned they mentioned the fifty dollar price point uh, as opposed to the ninety. Twenty percent of that was the cost of the terracotta tile. So I mean, this was, you know, a significant cost savings for a project that ultimately performed better. And you know, as as Greg uh, indicated in more detail and much more eloquently, I'll just summarize with a brick, brick and block project. You have a lot of different materials, a lot of complexity in the detailing, a lot of subs involved, a lot of people on site, a lot of schedules, a lot of things that can go wrong. With an insulated precast sandwich panel, you have a full system all in, all in one. So you've got your wall panel system every 12 feet. You've got uh, your roof. You've got uh, the, the glass, and it is uh, you know, a, a lot more streamlined. It's something that we don't even consider or call an alternate building delivery system anymore. And for the right kind of system, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one other little detail I'll mention, the spacing on this project worked out so that we were able to match the spacing so that when, when you looked at it, you couldn't tell where one panel started and, and one ended, uh, the, the reveal spacing between the tiles were, were identical. Here you can see, because you can see the, the panel divisions below, but just looking at a typical elevation, uh, you couldn't tell, I can tell you here, those first three tiles is where the panel started. And what, I'm trying to remember now, what, was it three-eighths? What was that? It was really small. Yeah, the joints? The joints. 
I'm gonna, I go back, it was in that detail I had a minute ago, but I, I will say that was one of those things that um, we, we, exactly what Dirk just said, the panel has Five four eights. tile, has yeah. three tiles, mm -hmm. 12 feet wide, three, four foot tiles, but we didn't want, we wanted the panel set tight enough that you couldn't pick it up. Well, you can imagine the erectors, <laughs> we want three quarters of an inch, you know? and they wind and wind and wind, and then they just did it perfectly. And I, it was like three eighths of an inch, and they held it the whole way. So go, go back to the corner detail. So Greg, you guys try to talk Steve into doing just a chamfer, like a straight, small, short, I know when, what battles to choose to fight. Um, there, uh, Jay Dunn did advocate that, yes. I just stay out of that. Did, did you try to throw the dollar they the did, thing yes. into the argument? It, it, that, it was thrown, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. Did the owner get a chance to say on that? Uh, I don't know if they ever got involved in it. It was yeah. one of the things that, uh, Hen, with Henry being the donor and a really good friend of Steve's and a really good friend of Jay uh, Dunn's, there were times when they just said, we're just going to do this thing. So I, I doubt that it was a high profit job for them. There were a lot of things they just, okay, if that's, if that's what you think and you think it's going to make Henry happy, we'll just do it. So. And they weren't the only ones that were a little nervous about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So is this a standard panel? <laughs> it's, we haven't done, uh, I thought we would do another one of these by now. We haven't, but there have been many others that have been done in other parts of the United States by other producers. This project in many ways opened up a floodgate of, I get a lot of calls about terracotta. Unfortunately, they're usually for projects on the east or west coast, which we, we don't get out to either coast. We, cover the Midwest corridor from top to bottom, get as far east as St. Louis or Illinois, as far west as Denver, Colorado. Where, where'd you say the baguettes were made? I mean, not the baguettes, but the pieces. The terracotta? Germany, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, they, an NDK produced them I think they did produce them. They have a couple of plants. I think they did do it in Germany, but the clays come from a variety of carefully selected sources all over. Like some of that clay came from Spain, some of it came from, to get those different colors. The clays came from all over the place that they gathered together to make those tiles. Did you just like specific standard colors? They, they were all standard. We did, yes, we did use you standard. Custom color. We did know where to draw the line on that one, yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, MBK has a very wide range of colors. And we also used the most cost-effective finish. There's a couple places on the job there's an orange glazed tile stuck in here and there for effect. But we used their, their most uh, cost-effective finish on the face, too. And I should mention J.E. Dunn. They have a very deliberate uh, cost analysis, uh, logistics, and risk assessment process when they look at projects. It's one of the best and one of the most sophisticated in the industry. So we always, you know, appreciate uh, when when we have that that process to to back it up. But it, it was uh, r really a great process. Uh, appreciate you all choosing to spend this final breakout session with us and. I hope we got through talking before you got through listening. The jury thought that this was an excellent solution to uh, many of the problems we run into in, in collegiate buildings. The use of terracotta is an excellent solution when applied to a, to a building of this type and using it with a precast concrete system like this uh, brought about a, a result that the jury thought was exceptional. So what we have now, I believe, is a much more affordable way for us to introduce terracotta as an exterior building material. It has been highly desirable for residential projects as well as education projects. And what we're finding now today is that precast is going to bridge the gap between unaffordable opportunities to do terracotta and a very affordable way to do it. What we liked about this project is that it's a unique application of terracotta, not only on precast, but on an insulated wall panel. 
One of the things that struck all the judges regarding this particular project was the research that went into the design of these panels. Um, they did quite a bit of research and testing of the system that they were proposing to use, which employed an insulated wall panel and a terracotta veneer. The terracotta manufacturer also did his own research to try and assure a high-performing precast concrete wall system. Using terracotta on an insulated wall panel really shows the versatility that can be done with high-performance precast products. 